Hey guys, welcome to another video for Anatomy and Physiology. In this video, we're taking a look back at the lecture we had last week with the uh, synovial joints. So we're going to be looking at all six types of synovial joints and looking at examples of where they can be found in the body. So there are six fundamental types of synovial joints. All six of them can be found in the upper limb. So for the most part, we'll be focusing on, the, on our arm, the upper limb. So we're going to list them also in descending order of mobility. So in other words, we're going to start with the joint that has the most mobility, that has the most range of motion, and then we're going to work our way down to the least. So starting off, we have a, a multi-axial joint, and there's only one. So this is the most mobile. This is the ball and socket joint. Secondly, we have three biaxial joints. We have the condylar, the plane, and the saddle joint. Okay, all of these are found in the hand, the wrist down. And then lastly, there's two monoaxial, meaning that there's basically one axial, one axis that they function in, and that's the hinge joint and the pivot joint. So let's go ahead and take a look at the first one, the ball and socket joint. So as I mentioned, all six of these joints are located or can be found uh, in the upper limb. And so the first one we're looking at is ball and socket. This is the shoulder there's two places you can find this actually. It's the shoulder and the hip. These are the only two places where you'll find these multi-axial joints. So one bone, typically one bone will have a smooth surface like the head of the, of the humerus, okay? And you also have the, the head of the, of the femur, okay? And that, and that smooth spherical head will fit into a cup-like socket on the other end, like the glenoid cavity or the acetabellum and the pelvic girdle. So we're looking at here as a glenoid cavity of the scapula that's being connected to the, to the head of the humerus. And as you can see here, this is only one example of what this joint can do. Again, this is a multi-axial, so it can, as you can see here, we're, so we're moving back here. This is a, a shoulder extension. Okay, so we're moving the shoulder back. As you can see, it's, it's a ball and socket joint. I have the, I have the deltoids kind of hidden, so you can, we can see right through them. Let's look at another example of how this joint functions. We also have, we also have the abduction and adduction. I'm going to take a look underneath here. Actually, let me go ahead and hide the deltoids like I did earlier. Well, there you go right there. We can see that. So again, this is just, you know, another motion that you can do with the with this particular ball and socket joint is uh, circumduction. So this is a multi-axial. It can, has the greatest range of motion of all the different joints that we're going to look at, all six of them. Okay, so let's go ahead and move move on to our, our next joint. This is a condylar joint. And along with our condylar joint, we're also looking at the plane joint and the saddle joint. So again, these joints are the next, moving along the line of our synovial joints. Uh, and just remember that synovial joints uh, different from our cartilaginous or fibrous joints in that they allow more free movement. So uh, the most, the most, uh, Flexibility, the most range of motion that we have with our multi-axial being the ball and socket. And now we're moving down the line to the, the next level, if you will, of joints that are not as movable. So these are now biaxial, not multi-axial joints. And there's three of these again, condylar, plane, and the saddle joint. So let's go ahead and dive in and take a look at these. Now look at the condylar joint real quick. So with the condylar joint, one of the things to notice is the oval-shaped condyle of one bone and how it articulates with the elliptical cavity of the other. And this particular joint you'll find uh, at the joints at the metacarpal and the uh, phalanges. So if you kind of put your hand in front of you, you know, close your fist. Now, and pay attention to the joint you, you, where your knuckles are at, essentially. So again, metacarpals and the phalanges. And you'll notice that you can close, you can close your hand. You can make a fist, right? So that's one. It's kind of like, it's acting kind of like a hinge joint. And then open your hand wide open again. And again, you're only looking at the metacarpal phal uh, phalange joint. And notice that you can open your fingers. So your hand's wide open now. And you can widen your fingers and close them with the hand wide open. So there you have that, that biaxial movement. You can close like a hinge and then you can open, uh, you can fan them out. Uh, that's, that's the benefit of having that condylar movement. Okay. And then we're looking at the, the plane joint. Now the plane joint's not quite as obvious because and, and it allows just a little bit less movement. Those are the joints that you'll find in your and some of the wrist bones, okay, and also in the ankle bones. So again, they allow for some movement but not a lot. Why typically you'll you'll sprain an ankle or 
um, or wrist if you're landing on it wrong or run on it wrong. So you have the, the plane joint allowing for some biaxial movement on the wrist and ankle. And then lastly, you have the saddle joint. So the saddle joint is between the thumb, okay, the first metacarpal of the thumb and your trapezium in the hand. So again, stick out your hand in front of you and notice that with your thumb, you can, you can bring in your thumb, okay, you can bring it into the hand and then bring it out and you can also kind of move it frontwards and backwards and you can also twirl it around, but you cannot rotate. Now notice also with, um, with the uh, condylar joint and the saddle joint, these joints that you know they have biaxial movement, but they do they don't rotate. With the plane joint, with the plane joint, there is just a tiny bit of rotation. But again, not 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 very distinguishable. Not like again, um, well, with the one that we'll deal with at the end, which is your hinge joint or your pit uh, your pivot joint, and how that can actually rotate. So in any case, um, so you have your trapezium and thumb, your saddle joint. And the, and the range of motion that you have there in your thumb. And thanks to that, you have, you know, our, our thumbs allow us to grip things, to hold on to things um, in, a, in a much more uh, dexterous way. You can play the piano, you can play the guitar. Some of us might even have the hyperflexation gene where you, your thumb can bend back forward. I actually came across a story not too long ago from a book called The Violinist's Thumb from Sam Keen. Uh, the story of Niccolo, I'm gonna, I'm gonna butcher the last name, Paganini. Paganini. And uh, so this story goes as he was a very talented violinist. And um, a lot of it was due to the fact that he was able to extend, he was able to, to hyperextend his fingers. He had a, a freakishly wide grip in his hands because his joints, he could hyperextend his joints and his hand could play notes on the violin that others couldn't. This is during a time when uh, DNA was not very well understood. So if, if, if he would be here now, we'd know that you know, we could just look into his DNA history and see maybe his grandmother or mom or dad had this genetic variant that was passed on to him. But at, at his point, uh, he was so talented and his hands were able to move so freakishly that people thought that he had actually sold his, that he had sold his soul to the devil, um, not understanding that it was actually a genetic anomaly that allowed him to extend his hands the way that he did. And, and in fact, this caused problems for him because uh, it was caused other other health issues for him with joint pain and and fatigue. So he struggled with fatigue almost all his life. And in fact, at the height of his career, he had to cancel he had to cancel a lot of his shows because of the joint pain that he was experiencing. So uh, that that's for this is our three biaxial joints that we're talking about, our synovial joints. And now let's that's what one, two, three, four. So let's move on to our last one. Our last one is dealing with uh, our last two, sorry, our last set is a monoaxial. So this is the least, the least mobile, the least range of motion that you're going to have with the joint. And that is our hinge joint and our pivot joint. So taking a closer look at the hinge, at the hinge um, joint that we have here, uh, we're looking at the bent, the bending of the elbow. And we're going to zoom in a little bit here. And so we're looking at the arm. Here's the humerus and then here's the ulna. And you can see the trochlear notch articulating with the trochlea of the humerus. Okay, and then we have that hinge movement there, the olicum process. And then you can see it right there. So here's the trochlea and then here's the trochlear notch right there and the trochlea. And you can see the hinge movement. Okay, so that's pretty much all you can do. You know, you can't really do any lateral movement, any sliding. It's basically just a hinge. Just think of a door hinge. Um, that's all it can do. Now, that's just that particular joint, but you'll notice right next to it, you have the radius right here. So you have the radius, you have the head of the radius articulating with the capitulum of the humerus. Let me give it a right side up view here. All right, so here's the head of the radius right there with the capitulum. Now, another thing I want to take a look at is how you can pronate and supinate your arm. So let's take a look at that real quick. So we're seeing here how the arm is supinating right here and it's pronating. So along with it being able to hinge, your arm can also twist, it can pivot thanks to our pivot joint, which is the last of our synovial joints. Again, our synovial joints allowing us the greatest range of movement. So notice, notice the head of the radius here. Notice how it's turning like a wheel, it's pivoting off the capitulum and also 
the radial notch of the ulna right here. In fact, I should get rid of that muscle. Let me get rid of that real quick. Okay, that's the best that I can do. So notice the head of the radius turning on the capitulum and the radial notch of the ulna. So that's a pivot joint. Now, another example, another great example of a pivot joint is your atlas, your atlas and your and your axis and how they come together with the dens process. And, re and recall with the transverse ligament going around the dens and how the neck can, can basically rotate uh, shaking uh, no, the no motion. That's gonna do it for our six types of synovial joints. Again, that was ball and socket, condylar, plane joint, hinge joint, pivot, and saddle joint. Thanks for watching guys and good luck in your studying.